Hey, everybody. We are back on with my co-host, Steve Flink, tonight. And wow, are we looking forward to having this discussion. One of our very favorite topics, Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi. As many uh, may know, Andre was my idol growing up. I followed him and his results religiously. Many of you also know Steve's latest book, which I have right here. It's called Pete Sampras, Greatness Revisited. If you haven't purchased the book yet, definitely go ahead and get it. Such great writing, such great insight that, that Steve got from Pete, um, not only from Pete, but from Pete's peers and competitors. I myself reread it just for the second time in prep for this discussion. So, um, Steve, this, this is a fun discussion. You ready to do this? Absolutely, David. I, I look forward to it. It, it, it. It's so compelling because there's such contrast between there's such different people, such different players. And that's what always made it so gripping for the public. And they each had their own constituencies, you might say, you know, and uh, fervid, you know, really fervent fans. And uh, it, it, it was pretty electric whenever they met, David. And I saw an, an awful lot of their, uh, their biggest contests. And we can't wait to, to hear your thoughts on some of those biggest contests. You know, before we get into this topic, please note that you know, while we'll touch on this at, at, at the end of the discussion, this is really not going to be a debate of, of who was better. Um, even the biggest Andre fans, including myself, and I'm sure even Andre himself, um, would say Pete got the better of them. But what we will dive into is, is the relationship between them, the rivalry that existed, and, and again, some of the most amazing matches that people um, still even talk about today. So with that, um, let's just get it started. And, and it all started, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start at the professional level. They, they knew each other at the junior level, but starting at the professional level, 1989 Italian Open, I believe Andre got to the finals of that tournament, should have won it. He lost a five setter to Alberto Mancini. Andre should have won it in four sets, if I remember correctly, but he played Pete Sampras earlier in that tournament totally waxed him 6-2-6-1 on clay. Andre was better on that surface than Pete throughout his career. Um, I remember highlights of that match. Pete had trouble keeping more than two, three balls in play during that match. Well, keep in mind, David, he, Andre had already been, uh, he'd already climbed to number three in the world the previous year as an 18 year old. He was very it, 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 partly because of the structure of his game and being a base on you could look to, to different reasons for why he was so good so young but he was and he had already arrived in 88 semis of the french and semis of the u.s open three in the world really had a magnificent year so coming in 89 he's a pretty confident fellow pete had just turned pro the previous year but really just finding himself i mean it, it, he was in the process of really it was a developmental phase. He knew it. He would eventually, a few months later, get killed by Michael Chang in similar fashion at the French Open yeah. about a month later. So yeah. Yeah, looking back, it's not that surprising because uh, Sampras had not really, Sampras was a much better player a year and a half later uh, when he played Agassi in the U.S. Open final. But, but in Rome in 89, to the point where Agassi kind of uh, recounted it in his book, about how he, he just thought nothing. He really was very unimpressed. But what, what, of course, what he didn't understand and what many didn't understand was Pete was always thinking the big picture and the long run. And therefore, he wasn't really concerned about some drubbings early in his career, as long as he kept working on his game, shaping it, and turning himself into the one, one of the great servant volleyers of all time, one of the great players of all time. But it yeah. just took longer to develop that style. He wasn't terribly worried about it, but I think people like Andre underestimated him as a result of performances like the one you just alluded to in Rome. Right. And you know, to me, something happened a few months later um, after the Italian Open in New York at the 1989 U.S. Open that had nothing to do with Andre. But for those that remember, Pete Sampras beat Mats Wielander, the defending champ. And yeah, you can say Wielander was dealing with some motivational issues and this and that. I don't think that meant anything to Pete for a young professional to come to New York, beat the defending champ. You know, confidence is a huge, huge thing at the elite level. I don't think, and I, I want to ask you this. I'm not sure Pete goes on his run the following year. If he didn't have his success in 89, again, defeating Mats Wieland, you know, you go back to a tournament where you've had previous success at, you start to feel good about it. You start to feel comfortable. I'm not so sure that 90 run 
happens if he doesn't have success in 1989? Yeah, I mean, you can make that case. You certainly can make that case. And then I, I, I mean, it was a very big win for him. For Wielander, yes, he was starting to slide. Out. Wielander, of course, David, had the year before won three of the four majors, number one in the world, yeah. and capped it all off with the U.S. Open win, five sets in the final over Lendl. So he was kind of on a downslide in 89. He wasn't as motivated, as you said. However, he fully expected to beat Pete Sampras when they went out into the evening air at the U.S. Open. He, he really thought he was going to win that match, and Sampras... Not only did he beat him, David, but he beat him in five sets. It was very impressive that he could come through in the clutch in the fifth with everything, all the chips on the line. And uh, having to fight up break points near the end, it was a really tough, hard struggle, but he got through it. And, and uh, yes, I think it made a difference to the next year because it, it, a player of Wielander's stature, to beat him in a major like that, even though Pete ended up losing in the round of 16, it didn't matter. That Wielander win was was hey. was one of those big wins that you want to record on the way up. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And, you know, you, you go into now that the, the year, the following year, 1990, Andre had previously made the semis in 88 and 89 in New York, both times losing to Lendl. Um, a few months before you was open. Remember Andre hadn't played Wimbledon in, in 1990. He started in very early in his career at 87, but then he took a pause from 91 uh, and started again in 91, but Andre had made the finals of the French open in 1990 should have won that match against Andres Gomez. Didn't he's now back in the final after beating Becker in the semifinal, he's back in the U S open finals, 1990 against a young Pete Sampras. This was Andre's time. And yeah, Pete had an unbelievable run. I mean, he beat Lendl and McEnroe in back-to-back matches, quarters and semis. Now he's playing Andre Andre's now in his, what second final, right? I mean, he's, he's played in a couple semis. Now this was Andre's time. Andre fully expected to go out and win his first grand slam title. And as we all saw that did not happen and that did not happen in a drastic way. Well, yeah, you alluded to the, the big Sampras wins over L- Lendl, of course, coming into that quarterfinal with Sampras had been in eight finals in a row, which was a record. It was a, sp- a remarkable achievement, winning three titles in that span. Sampras beat him in five. He also had upended Thomas Mooster in the previous round, the number six seed. Pete was seeded 12. So that was also an impressive win from a set down and nearly went two sets down and beat him in four. So then he beats Lendl in five. Then he beats McEnroe in four. Agassi, as you said, what he was, he was obviously concerned with himself as well. He should have been. And so I think he must have felt when he beat Becker. Uh, there was, that was a big win from a set down, and, and Becker, of course, was the defending champion then. Becker had won in 89, and I think uh, Andre felt he perhaps had survived his hardest hurdle. Not that he was going to take it totally for granted against Pete Sampras, but I think he felt like Becker might have been the most dangerous guy for him at that stage. He lost to him in Davis Cup earlier in the summer, and uh, I mean, excuse me, lost to him in Davis Cup in 89, the previous summer, so... Becker still worried him at that stage as the, as those years went on, he started to dominate for us. But anyway, he comes in. Yes. Fully expecting to win having been in the two previous semis, but what, what maybe he didn't understand was that Sampras had gone from strength to strength, fine match against Mooster, uh, terrific performance against Lendl, even better in beating Macano in a four set semi on a Saturday afternoon in front of a New York crowd that was very familiar with John McEnroe and hoping that John was uh, going through something of a, uh, you know, kind of a revitalized stage of his career. And John, of course, had last won the title way back in 84. That's when he won his fourth title, but they thought maybe he's coming alive again. Maybe John is going to, is, has been reawakened because he'd had a great tournament, but when Pete beat him in four, he was really starting to peak. And I think, but then for the Agassi match, he took it a notch and a half higher. And he I want to stop you right there real quick, yeah. because you were at these matches that we're going to talk a, a, about a few of the U.S. Open matches. Sure. You were there on the grounds for the ones that we're talking about going into that final. What the, I mean, the word on the ground was Pete didn't really have a chance. It was all Andre, right? I mean, that was the talk at that. Well, point. yes, yes and no. There were a few of us that have, who had been watching Pete round by round that thought, wow, it watch out he is really dangerous and and it, you still had to make Agassi the favorite going in yes but we we I, some of us I think sense that Sampras was was coming of age that it was just something about the way he had carried himself in those wins over 
especially over Lendl and Makinos. But on the other hand, here's Agassi, two semis in a row preceding this. Uh, you alluded to the French final that he should have won against Gomez. So it seemed like that, that it almost like it was preordained in some ways that this was going to be his breakthrough and it was going to, and even a player as formidable as Pete Sampras wouldn't beat him. But Pete really from just came out of the blocks. The crowd was really astonished by his performance. And I think many of them came out there expecting Agassi to win. Many of them came out there hoping he was going to win and supporting him, but they were, they were in awe of this, of the dazzling performance that Sampras put on right from the opening bell. You know, he yeah, beat there's really not much to talk about that match because there was really no question once that first ball happened. I mean, like you said, it, it, it appeared that Pete took it up a notch and a half from the previous rounds he that he, he looked so impressive. It was a straight sets. There, there were looks, the cameras showed looks on Andre's face where he was like a deer in headlights. Like he did not know what, what hit on them. Well, Credit that's to, what Sam yeah, that's exactly what Sampras said himself when I spoke to him for the book, is that's what, that when he looked at, back on it later and watched clips of it, he could he could sense that Andre, it was like a deer in the, in the headlights. And uh, Mary Carrillo also noticed it on camera, calling the match for television, that yeah. he had a scared look in his eyes, understandably so, because of what was being thrown at him. Yeah, and, I think, and, and, and there were sometimes uh, after second serve aces, you just saw the camera would go to Andre and he would just kind of, shake his head. I mean, there wasn't much that he could do. It was an oh, astounding performance him. by Pete Sanders. Absolutely. Couldn't break him. It was 6'4", 6 6'3", 6 6 And, and uh, Sampras told me when I interviewed him for the book that he had never played that well in his life, even in practice. He, he didn't even, couldn't fully explain it other than he went from the semi to the final. And he just sort of blocked out everything else. His mind was so uncluttered that he wouldn't allow himself. He thought it was a good thing that there was no day off. In, in That's a sense. what I was going to say. At that yeah. stage, he and he referenced that in your book. He said if there was a day off that there, you know, back then was Super Saturday in the men's final the very next day. If there was more time for him to think, he may have played more mental gymnastics with himself, but he didn't have the time to do that. No, he just no, he just looked at it like he was just playing another tennis match. It was in it was a remarkably mature performance. And I thought, especially considering once you go up two sets to love, maybe then you start to think. Maybe then you have that letdown that he had a little bit like he had against Lendl in the quarters when he's up two sets and Yvonne takes him into a fifth. And that could have been very exceedingly dangerous against Agassi had he allowed that to happen. But no, there was never a sign of hesitation, never a sign of questioning himself. And for a first major final, it was what a way to put yourself on the map. And I remember him saying after the match it was interesting. He said something along the lines of, you know, I'm the U.S. Open champion and nobody can ever take this away from me because he didn't know yet where he was headed. He didn't know that he, in a few years time he was going to start winning these majors, picking them up in clusters and that he was going to make a move to try to win the most majors in men's tennis history. At this stage, it was like, oh, it had happened sooner than he expected. And he was just grateful, just yeah. plain grateful that he had won the Open. Yeah, I want to go to him to same spot five years later, which really was a career defining moment. I think for both players, um, this was the match <laughs> and I, and we'll set it up a little bit, but this was the match that really sank Andre down to his career low ranking, which got to as low as 141 in the world. Um, this summer, the, the 1995 year, Andre and Pete were really in their peak. You remember Nike doing all the great commercials with both of them. They were both playing the top level. They played the finals of Australia, which Andre won. They then played back-to-back -back in Indian Wells in Miami. Pete won in Indian Wells. Andre won in Miami. I think it was like a third set breaker in Miami. Andre then won pretty much everything in sight. That summer hardcourt swing leading up to the Open. He beat Edberg. Uh, in the title in Washington, D.C. He closed out Pete in three sets in Montreal. Um, he, he killed Michael Chang in Cincinnati. He then saved two match points against Richard Krychek at New Haven before winning that title. That's four titles in five weeks, 20 straight wins heading into the U.S. Open. He then wins six more matches, including beating Becker in a late match on Saturday. So he's got 26 matches in a row. And that Becker match, he played late. He played the second match. Again, it was still the back-to-back -back days. They didn't have a day off. And I can't believe they did that for so many years because that's got to be brutal physically, especially if you're the second match on. Um, Andre had a physical match with Boris that night. 
Um, and in Andre's book, woke up, he, he stated he woke up the next morning in agony, someone's rib cage. Um, it was it was a tough physical match. He then plays Pete in the final. And again, Pete comes out big. It was obviously it's something in the first set that, that you can refer to that kind of defined the, the moment of that match. Well, yes. Let me just go back for a bit, uh, David, because you summed it up beautifully from Agassi's side of the net, the kind of year that he'd had. And that also, with that summation, it was three out of four times that he'd beaten Pete, that Australian final. The, then, of course, the finals of Miami after Pete beat him in Indian Wells, and then the Canada final over the yep. summer. So at the edge, clearly going in. And he had the big winning streak. However, he had lost in the semis of Wimbledon from a set and two breaks up. 6-2, 4-1, double break against Becker. Loses an agonizing mm -hmm. four-set match. And then Pete beat Boris in the final. So I think from Sampras's perspective, yes, he was a little disappointed not to win a title over the summer on the hard courts, but he had that final with Agassi. He got enough matches in. That's He was trying to win those tournaments, but his mind all along was, I must mindset was i must peak for the u.s open that's where i that's the biggest match we're going to play that's where i want to be at my best that's what i'm looking for and sure enough that's what he found because he played a solid tournament all through the 95 one little scare against mark philippousis but he beat courier in a in a, in a four set semi which was the perfect preparation for agassi and then they go out there and as you said you made a reference. It was a critical point, which was set point for Sampras in the first set. And there had been no breaks up to that point. I guess he's serving at four or five. And, and they got into what was maybe one of the most arresting rallies they've ever played against each other. It just was, it was eye popping, corner to corner, 22 shots, each of them hitting the ball as hard as they could and trying to pull their opponent off the court. And finally, that's what Sampras did. He had a cross-court forehand that Agassi could only uh, hit back deep down the line, but without too much on it. And he was really stranded, couldn't get back into position. And Sampras laced the backhand cross-court into the open court for a winner. That was a really one of the most important points of their careers, you could argue, because it really, it fueled Sampras with confidence. It was deflating to Agassi. It carried Pete through the second set. And although, although Andre won the third in a gritty effort, Pete came back and got the break at five all in the fourth and served it out. So I think that point was, was really what swung the entire encounter around to Sampras. And it was demoralizing for, for Agassi because it was his kind of a point. It was a rhythmic rally from the baselines. There was really no opportunity for Pete to get to the net the way he might have liked, but he outdueled uh, the, you know, the he outdueled his great backcourt rival from the baseline. And, and beat him at his own game. And I think that one, that one really meant a lot to Pete Sampras. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll say two things. It's almost like when you win 26 matches in a row, it's almost like you think of Gonzaga this year, undefeated in college basketball. They have an unbelievable year. They lose the championship game. Well, you know, would they trade a couple losses earlier to win it? Of course they would, right? Same thing, Kentucky, 2015, undefeated team. They lose in the semis to Wisconsin. Of course, they would trade everything to lose a couple early on to win it. That that match, that 1995 final, I will say that took three years with the exception of Andre winning the gold in 96 in Atlanta. I think that match set Andre back around three years because he didn't start coming back until 1998. Didn't have much success in the slams in 98, but he started getting his ranking way yeah, back yeah. up there in 1998. Yes, he won a lot of tournaments, did not, as you say, didn't have a great slam year, but but otherwise he played really well and he started to he started to reemerge. But yes, it did because, you know, you, you reverse the roles and I think Sampras would have psychologically recovered a lot sooner than Agassi did. But yeah. Agassi put so much into that 95 campaign that it was so much anticipation among the players and the public about who was going to win that match. You alluded to all the Nike ads. It was also a New York times magazine cover story on Sampras and Agassi, which they rarely did, which was perfectly timed because it came out right before the open. And then they met in the finals. So yes, it had lasting repercussions to be sure because it sort of carried Sampras into 96 with great confidence and self-belief. And here was Agassi questioning himself to the hill. And uh, yes, he got the Olympics. It wasn't a strong Olympic field, by the way, and, and Sampras was not there, but it still meant a lot to him and it's good for him. And he did make the semis of the open and 
lost it, but he lost badly to Michael Chang and then Sampras beat Chang in that final. The 97 was, I guess he almost disappeared. You know, he finally came and played the open. He'd skipped the other majors and that, and that's when he went down to 141 in that, that autumn of, of 97. But that's really what also brought him back. David was that he had the, he had the professionalism and the determination to go out and play these challengers, which would, could have been humiliating to him, but he didn't allow that to happen. And he worked his way back, set the stage, the recommitment to, to having that better 98. So that thankfully, was that. Thank, I mean, thank God he did, because I think Pete was thankful for it. Andre obviously was happy that he got back in, in the sport of tennis. Thank God he did, because that would have been sad for, I think, everybody involved, uh, in any area than the sport of tennis, if he never recovered from that, because. Oh, I, but it, it absolutely did. But, but then what happened was we sort of lost the rivalry in that night. It, they played, but we didn't get any major matches with them in 96, 97, 98. That was a long time to not have the two premier players in American tennis and, and, to, and, and not for them not to meet in a major. And obviously that had all to do with, with Andre Agassi trying to rediscover himself, but. By 99, of course, he had. Yeah, and in 99, he he did have a great run. Um, They did meet in the Wimbledon final. I want to stick with the U.S. Open for now. We will touch the Wimbledon final in a bit, but I want to stick with the U.S. Open now. Um, The 2001 U.S. Open quarterfinal, four-set win. uh, Again, Pete Sampras comes out on top. You're hearing a common theme, these U.S. Open matches with with Pete coming on top, but four sets. No breaks to serve, four tie breaks, standing ovation right before the four set tie break for two people. Night match in New York. You were there. Not, have you ever witnessed a, a better atmosphere than that one? No, no. The crowd, it was the fact that it was a quarterfinal was such a treat for the fans that they were seeing. The, and they also couldn't know at this stage, as it turned out, I mean, Pete wasn't around the game that much longer. Andre was. But so they, they kind of sensed that this was a sort of a magical moment in the rivalry. And then on top of that, David, yes, the, 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 the atmosphere was, was highly charged and, and, and sort of reverential toward both players, by the way. The crowd was great that night toward both of them. But also the conditions. I've never seen it in the old stadium the way it was that night. Somehow the wind disappeared. It was like a wind tunnel in there up until they put the roof up. Uh, back when they started building the roof in 15, you know, and and we had it, I guess, for the following year. But until that roof was built on Ash Stadium, which then knocked the wind out, it was often swirling in in really difficult fashion. It was a constant challenge for the players. They dealt with it beautifully, but you you expected heavy winds. That night, for some reason, it was as if the gods, it was preordained, and they said, we must not let that happen tonight. We want, And that was also one of the reasons why the level of play was so magnificent and i'll tell you what in their 34 match series david i've never seen on both sides of the net a better match between these two because agassi made the comeback from 6-3 down to win the first set tie break then sampras won three tiebreakers in a row from there as you said no service breaks and this is this is uh, you know this is pete sampras playing the, the best returner uh, of his era and and many believe the best of all time although djokovic in most eyes has surpassed him and, and there's Sampras putting a lot of pressure on Andre's, Andre's service games, but Agassi backing it up so beautifully from the baseline. Sampras chipping and charging, Agassi passing on a dime. That match had it all. And they've never, they've played great finals, but they've never played a match where, where the two of them were both so close to the tops of, to, to their zenith in form against each other. And so I've always treasured that, that 2001 quarterfinal. That's when sports are at the actual uh, absolute climax. That's when it's at the best. When you get two competitors, whether it's individuals or teams playing to their best ability head to head at the same time of the same night against each other. That's when the magic really, really happens. And um, what a match that was. And, you know, again, we didn't hey, know. David, by the way, just a quick point that standing ovation that you mentioned, that was, that was also really chilling and, and poignant. And the the uh, Andre even clapped his racket when they were yeah. they all kind of stepped back and like yeah. t- tried to bring it all take it all in. And Sampras said he took stock of it for about ten seconds. He couldn't believe it. And then obviously you got to get your mindset back, get to get tuned back into the match. But that was my point about that was I don't think they were applauding just for this match in this moment. I think they were applaud- basically that was almost their way of saying that you guys have been 
so amazing over the last decade and, and beyond. And they, they basically saying, thank you for all you have given us, because we know this might be the end of the match right now. And we don't know how many more times we're going to see you against each other. That's how I interpreted their, their, uh, their, their, their great standing ovation. That's interesting. I'd never heard that before. I thought it was just kind of more in the moment thing. Like this match is just insane. And thank you for appreciating what we're trying to do here down on the court. That's interesting. Um, very, very poignant. Yeah, that's great. Again, now the following year, 2002, we know Pete that year was struggling mightily. Um, we didn't know if this was Pete's last year on tour. I don't think Pete even knew if it was his last year on tour. Um, you could set it up a little bit, but again, that last match, 2002 U S open final, who would have thunk it, but Pete and Andre meet again. Um, that match to me, Andre had so many chances to break in that fourth set, especially early in that fourth set. And he couldn't convert. And a couple of those, Pete just made some unbelievable stab volleys to save um, break points. If that match goes five, I definitely give Andre the edge in that. But um, to set that up a little bit, a lot of people didn't give Pete a chance to even make it far in the U.S. Open. No, he was seated. Uh, keep in mind, he had won Wimbledon in 2000, which was the last tournament he had won prior to this 2002 Open. And he, so he had, he'd been through a 33 tournament drought for him. A lot of it being motivational because he broke the he broke Roy Emerson's record. Emerson held the record at the time for the men with 12 majors. He broke it with 13. And he would worked so hard and so long, so diligently to realize that goal that I think it was difficult getting fully motivated after that for the next two years. Not that I mean, he had the great open in 01 where he beat Andre and also beat Rafter and Safin and made the finals before losing to Hewitt. But overall, he, the engines were not churning in the same way. The, the, he just didn't have the same uh, insatiable desire to win uh, week in and week out and even major in and major out because he'd broken the record. But by the time he gets to the 02 open, and he's, he's heard so much talk of his demise and he's through and he's had it. And, and I, I, I think that really bothered him. He didn't show it. And, uh, but uh, deep down, I think it, it really brought out the depth of his pride. And so th that was driving him, but he was only seated 17th. You know, one time that wouldn't have even been a seating because uh, we used to have right. 16th seats, but so right. he, he, he safely made the cut, but that's not where we expect to see him seated. But he, he, he survived a really, riveting uh, skirmish played over two nights against Greg Ruzetsky, who had been the 97 U.S. Open finalist. That was a pivotal match. And then he went from there and beat Tommy Haas, who was a top three seed. And that was a big win. And then Andy Roddick, who had beaten destroyed him. Destroyed Andy. Yeah, destroyed Andy at another night match. As All these were night matches, Ruzetsky, Haas, and, and Andy. And Andy, of course, would win the U.S. Open the next year for his lone major. But Again, there were many thought coming in because I, and Andy was 2-0 and against Pete and because Pete had been struggling that may, maybe we were witnessing a changing of the guard. Maybe this was it, you know, uh, and, and uh, certainly Roddick was a really cocky young guy in all those great attributes that you like to see in a young player, not uh, certainly reverential towards Sampras and Agassi, but not afraid of them. So I think he came out there with the right attitude, but Sampras was so fired up and he got an early break and we saw the fist pump. And the next thing you know, he had blitzed Andy on, on what was, by the way, one of those typically windy evenings in the stadium. And uh, but he, he got through it. He won that match in straight sets, which was important because he'd had a lot of wear and tear. Five with Rosetsky, four with Haas. He didn't need another long match. And it also was a, an immense confidence boost to beat Roddick so handily and uh, with, with a really versatile, dazzling performance. And then that took him into the semis against Shalkin. Uh, and Shang Shalkin of the Netherlands, and he, and he didn't play his best, but he got through a couple of tiebreakers and then pulled away in the third set. And then, as you know, David, you, you tell us the Agassi story on the other half. I mean, uh, <laughs> the, the 2002, he beat, Andre beat Hewitt. Yes, yes. He, he beat Hewitt the first match of the day. Pete was the second. Was Andre no, the first? No, he, he was, he was, he, his was later. Pete was oh, the Andre early. was the second match again. Okay, so it. But, but Hewitt um, was the defending champion. So that yep, was a. Hewitt big, was the defending champion. And also Andre's coach, Darren Kale, had, had been coaching Hewitt yep. previously. So this was a big match. 
they both got a lot of satisfaction out of Andre beating Hewitt. But yes, it was. Yeah, the I think Brad. Brad was the coach. Brad was Andre's coach in two thousand one and two thousand two. The recent change was Darren was with Leighton, right. and then he switched over right. to Andre. So. Right. Um, so that that was interesting at all. But it was a very physical match. It was four sets. It was very physical. Andre won the fourth set quite comfortably, but just having to play that extra set was, it, I think, took something out of him possibly and. And uh, Peter managed to win his in straight and get off the court earlier. That always helped in those days if you were when we didn't have the day off. So, it was- yeah, I mean, the Super Saturday, they I said it was the best day in tennis. It was, but especially now with the physicality and everything, that yeah. it, I'm so glad they separated that out because oh, it's everybody. just a brutal, brutal everybody. turnaround. You would never, you would never get any good quality on the final because the players were just so beat up. I mean, but I remember, yeah. you know, for the book, David, I talking to Cahill about the final and. He described Andre beating Hewitt and the, the feeling of euphoria that they both had and going back and having dinner with their wives, driving to Long Island, and how he thought that Andre was feeling okay. He thought he was really in pretty good shape and that he was, he went, that he was in a good frame of mind, thinking that if he played his best, he could win. Yeah. So it was interesting to hear that because Cahill is a very earnest, honest guy, and I know, I know that that was authentic, what he was saying. But then you had Sampras, who despite the long drought, always believed himself believed in himself on big occasions and that's why he won 14 out of 18 major finals so he certainly believed that if he was at his best the trophy would be it would belong to him it, but it was yeah, that, that fourth set in that final i remember it to, it's so clear in my head i mean andre had so many looks to break well, he, I, I knew if, if andre got that break in the fourth fifth set was going to be a big advantage to andre well, here's the thing Here's the thing, David. Let's go back a little first. So first, you know, they're they're sort of sparring with each other and both playing well into the middle of the first set. And then Sampras really went on a spree and closed out the first set and went up an immediate he went up two breaks in the second, gave one of them back, but then closed it out really nicely. So it was three and four the first two sets and commanding. Then we get to the end of the third and it was a really steadfast stand from Andre before we get into the fourth, just briefly that for him to get into that tie break, he kept sort of fending Pete off and Pete had loved 30 at five all, but Andre finally breaks Pete who's serving into the wind at five, six in a long marathon game. He gets the break that gets him into the fourth. So yes, there were some anxious moments in the fourth. I will say though, I'm not, I don't think that one break would have been safe for Andre. Pete was threatening Andre as well on his serve. So I, I, I don't know. No, Pete that- was getting tired there. I thought Pete was getting tired there. Well, but, you know what, yeah. you know, yeah, but I'm saying if, if, it, if I took you game by game through that, you know, there, there's no doubt that he was, he felt like he could pounce too. And yes, yeah. so the big, the, the, he served from the same end into the wind that he had lost his serve at the end of the third. And that was a big moment. That, that was one of the times you're talking about when he was down a few break points. And one of them, he made an incredible stab back in a half volley drop shot. You know, it, 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 it died and Agassi came forward, scrambled, couldn't get it back. And then, uh, Pete fended off another and he held on in that marathon game. And then he had actually had a good opportunity to break Agassi who got out of it. And then at three, four, Pete was down break points again. Mm-hmm. And, and so, but, but you know what, at four, all he strikes at four, all he strikes and he breaks. We'll never know what would, have, what things would have been like physically in a fifth set, but Andre, it wasn't as if Andre got himself in that position. Had he broken and served for the fourth set, we never really, it really never came to that. And then when Sampras, right. Sampras made a clutch break at four all, and that's, that, that was sort of the difference between the two, the big, you know, who was better under pressure, the big point players, the tiebreakers, the previous year, Pete winning three out of four, that was sort of what separated them, but it would have been fascinating, as you say, be, uh, now what we also won't know is would Andre have been feeling it a bit in his legs? Cause he definitely had had that tough physical match with Hewitt. And, and I know he told Tony Trabert afterwards that, he was feeling it. So how would he, he would have been exhilarated. The crowd would have been exhilarated. So the because, adrenaline, I think would have helped him get through, yeah. but who knows? Yeah. Like you Sam, Sampras was such a disciplined athlete that I think he would have. And I talked to him about, about that for the book. He didn't want it to go five, but I don't think he would have faded either. I think it would have been, it would have been a, a really hard fought fifth if we'd ever got there, but he had, he had, he had completely outplayed Andre for two sets. Andre squeezed out a great effort to squeeze out the third and prevent it going to a tie break, which would have favored Sampras. And then the fourth was fourth was also hanging in the balance a bit, but Sampras uh, on the pressure points came through. 
Yeah, and we're going to talk about, uh, in a little bit, we're going to talk about Pete, late, how he plays late in sets. But um, we've, we've focused on the U.S. Open matches, and rightly so, rightfully so, because those were crucial matches in this rivalry. There was another match that I wanted to talk about because it, it just kind of defines Pete Sampras. So many times he did this, was the 1999 Wimbledon final. And uh, 1999, Andre was, again, on fire. There, he had won the French 1999, finally got that. He should have been his first slam. It actually was his it, – it, it took him, what, ten, nine years later to get it. Um, 1999, finally went in the French. He plays Pete in Wimbledon. He loses in the final. We're going to talk about that in a second. He then wins the U.S. Open, and then he wins the 2000 Australian. So Andre was on a roll during this time. He plays the final against Pete, 1999 Wimbledon, 3-3 in the first set. Andre has love 40 on Pete's serve. We've talked about this on previous pods. People have talked about this in other conversations. 3-3 in the first set. Andre has love 40 on Pete's serve. And in what felt like 17 seconds later, Pete holds and never looks back. And how he holds is with a combination of aces and service return winners takes the racket right out of your hand. And if you're Andre, you're just like, what just happened? And that game defined that match. That's a straight set win for Pete. Oh, it, did. Oh, he, it was a great, it was a great moment under pressure because it could have made a big difference if Agassi had gotten the break there and gone up a set and built a little confidence because he knew that Pete was the better grass court player. So he, he, I think he felt he needed that set more than Pete did. Absolutely. But that was one of the great clutch efforts I've seen Given the moment, given the, you know, that, that, that it's the seventh game of the first set and this looks like it's going to be the first break of the match and it looks like Agassi's going to get it. And, they, and, it, and yes, the racket was taken out of his hands. It was just great, a barrage of first and second serves from Pete. And he... Uh, the he, second uh, serve, Steve, and I know he talks to you about it, the second serve. He was not shy about going no. down the tee. I mean, second serve bombs. He was yep. not scared to do it. It's unbelievable. No, not at all. Not at all. And felt like, and felt by the way, out of respect for Agassi's return, that he felt like he had to do he it. Had to. He had to do it, but that it was in his best interest. Yeah. And you occasionally risk a double fault. Even Pete does serving that way, but but that was really the right game plan. And 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 amazing thing was he got that break. Uh, he got that hold, and then he breaks Agassi in the next game, serves it out. So suddenly, in ten minutes later, six three Sampras, and he's off and running. And the next thing, and he won the second six four, but played beautifully. Uh, I mean, it, it, it was it was, you know, the, the first two sets kind of resembled the first two sets of that U.S. Open final yeah. in Open that you know Agassi gets seven games, and and but he's he's clearly outplayed in the two sets, and. Uh, you know, it, it was it was remarkable. And then and then Agassi hung in the third set of that 99 Wimbledon final, but almost inevitably at five all, you know, once again, Pete gets that late set break at five all much as like he had done in the 95 U.S. Open final in the fourth set and serves it out as only he could masterfully, uh, you know, just no hesitation. And uh, yeah, that was a big match because here's the thing, David, Agassi had had not really you know you had described it earlier with the with the difficult years of 97 98 and uh, 96 7 and 8 really and then early in 99 he wasn't playing that great and his shoulder was bothering him and he, gilbert had to talk him into playing the french yeah and he had a lot of scares along the way and moya almost had him and and then in the final he's lost one and two the first two sets to medvedev and came back and won it in five and then at Wimbledon, he beat Rafter in the semis. And a lot of people were very excited by that. Very impressed as well. They should have been that he beat a servant volleyer of, of Rafter's stature to reach the final and, and against Pete. So a lot of people thought coming off the French was one of many occasions where people thought that the sort of the winds of momentum were behind Agassi and not Sampras. And so there were a surprising number of people. And I, I wrote about this in the book. Surprising number of people picking Agassi to beat Sampras in the 99 Wimbledon final. And I describe in the book how Dick Enberg was the commentator was saying he'd done an informal poll around the grounds. Yeah. And there were many people going with Agassi and John and John McEnroe said, well, Pete, uh, well, uh, Dick, that's very interesting, Dick. But I have to tell you, you know, I, I'm, I'm picking. Uh, I, I don't really understand that, you know, and he said, I, I've got to go with Pistol Pete. But that Agassi had inspired that kind of confidence in him because he was on this this little roll coming off the French, and Pete had not 
99 have been, he'd come off 98 where he, he got his number one ranking for the sixth year in a row. And, that, and then he was depleted. He didn't play the Australian at the start of that year. So he hadn't had a good start to 99 until he finally won at Queens Club a few weeks before Wimbledon. So there were all those, all those things in the air coming into that match. But it was another one of those uh, spectacular big match performances from Pete Sampras on the center court. Probably the best match he's, he's ever played, in, in my view. Yeah, I want to go back to a point you you kind of casually made um, a little while ago, and it's kind of Pete's style. And and Andre has talked about it, and and other uh, competitors of Pete have talked about it, where he's almost like kind of just going through the motions. Um, I don't know if you want to say lollygagging just through the first. You know, it could be one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. He's not playing great. He's not really giving your opponent any rhythm. Um, he's not giving his opponent any rhythm. But then, like you said, boom, it's 4-4. You think you're in it. And 90 seconds later, he broke and held, and the first set's over. And he did that throughout his career. And it's it's almost like, yeah, there were certain matches where we've already referred to. He's played lights out from the get-go. But there were plenty of matches where nothing special to him until it got to those critical junctures and stages of sets and and end of matches. And those are those are what define champions, Steve. I mean, absolutely. I mean, well, you know what, David, he had this supreme confidence in his ability to hold serve. He, he knew he had what, what is arguably the greatest serve the game has ever seen. And he believed in his ability to keep holding. And he knew that his opponents were fearful of it, that they didn't think they were going to get many opportunities to break him. So I think he looked at it a couple of ways. If he had an early break opportunity, if he suddenly got a guy down love 30, and this was the way Pancho Gonzalez played also, by the way. Get a guy down love 30 early at, at, say, first game of the set or at one all or two all. Go after it. But otherwise, he wasn't going to waste the energy if the other guy got up 30 love or 40 love or whatever, because he just was going to go right back and have another love hold or hold <laughs> at 15 and put the burden back on his opponent. But then there was no explaining uh, it was uncanny how well he did at four all or five all to find that inspiration to get the break. Now they felt pressure, yes, but but it, we, Pete did that so many times that you can't you just can't call it coincidental that he'd get that many critical breaks at those stages. And of course, he was a great tiebreaker player. He had nothing to fear in tiebreakers. He had a great record in breakers, but but he just somehow time and again four all five all big matches, big sets, he'd find a way. Yeah, that def that defines a champion with it without a doubt. Um, so uh, I think it's obvious, but you you got one player to hold serve to to win a match or win a title. Who who are you going with? You going with Pete? <laughs> no, there's no doubt about it. I mean, it's interesting because just talking to a friend of mine this past week and he was telling me he was re uh, Brad Faulkner's his name and he was rereading uh, Vince Spadia's book. And mm -hmm. Spadia in his book was saying that he thought. It, it, certainly looking back to his era, he was giving even Isovich the nod. And I said to my friend, I just not buying that because it, when it comes down to the crunch and it's six, five in the fifth and you're playing for your life, are you going to want Goran even Isovich to be serving at that, in that game? Or do you want Pete Sampras? And I, it's, yes, Goran's, uh, Goran's serve was fearsome. And, and, and it was Sampras said when we spoke with the book is the biggest weapon he ever faced. You know, he really had great respect for it. But nobody's going to tell me that Sampras' first and second serve combination and the way he served under pressure didn't surpass everyone else. Right. I, I would agree. So um, just some, some stats here to sum up their rivalry. I mean, Pete was 14-4 and four in Grand Slam finals. That, that's crazy. The overall head-to-head -head Pete versus Andre was 20-14. to 14. Andre had the best of Pete um, in Australia. Um, they, I think they only played once in the French open early and, and Andre beat yeah. him pretty yeah. easy. They only played once, but grand slam finals, um, Pete four to one Andre's sole win was the 1995 Australian open final grand slams in any round. Pete leads six, three Pete has four. He Pete completed his career, 14 slams, never won the French. Um, and you and I are going to have a separate discussion on why it's so hard to win the French open, especially for, for Americans. We'll do that separately. Um, but yeah, Pete had 14 slams, never won the French. Andre won eight slams, including the French in the Olympics. Um, I'll, I'll mention a couple things about Andre versus the big three. You yourself have a whole separate chapter um, in your discussions with Pete and with Roger, uh, Rafa and Novak event, how Pete would do against the big three. But 
Um, just because Andre played longer than Pete, he played Rafa twice. Um, Rafa beat him both times. Um, Andre and Roger played a lot. They played 11 times and Andre won the first three and then, uh, Roger won the next eight. Novak wasn't around yet. So, so Andre and Novak didn't play Hence, you know, what, what was interesting is Andre coached Novak a little bit later in their career. Um, you, you again, you yourself had a whole chapter talking to Pete and the big three about how Pete would fare against these three guys. And I, and I'll kind of let you speak about it a little bit if you want to take them one by one. Well, they, the, I, I spoke to a lot of people. I spoke to Djokovic himself. I spoke to lots of the likes of Mary Carrillo and, and Rafter and Edberg and all kinds of people about that. And the prevailing view, I would say, David, was that it, on the quicker courts, on the, on the hard courts and the grass, it, Pete would have done really quite well against all three. They, they wouldn't, it would have been difficult for all three, including Roger, because Roger. And let's liked, say, by the way, let, let's say in 2001, Pete did play Roger one time. Yeah. And Roger yep. did beat him in a, in a five setter in a good match in Wimbledon. But. Yeah, it was a great match. It was seven, five in the fifth. It was a beauty. And then, then they played some exhibitions in 2007 and eight where Pete Doesn't did you know, coming out. <laughs> yes, but they played, it was pretty serious kind of tone to it. And Pete served for the match against Roger in Madison square garden and beat him one other time. And it was pretty competitive. They had fun, but they were playing hard. And, and he, he felt that, uh, he mentioned that, you know, he, t- he spoke to me quite a bit about that, how he felt that even then at 36, he could hold his own. And I just feel like, you know, because he was a servant volleyer and because he was such a great athlete and that, that unlike a lot of other authorities, I don't think he would have had to compromise that much in the, the, if we put him into the current era. I think he would have played essentially the same way, except not to come in behind quite as many second serves, but he still would have served and volleyed a lot on the second and all the time on the first. And I think they would have been uncomfortable playing against him on forget Rafa on clay, because that's the one exception, because who can deal with Rafa on clay at his best? And you know, he's got 13 French opens, but otherwise, uh, you know, I think that, you know, Pete, that, that everybody seemed to feel like Pete against Rafa on the grass would have had a great chance, even on the grass that we have now. And, and, uh, you know, Roger might have been, they, 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 those would have been great matches, but that Pete would have held his own. And, and then the Novak one, that was fascinating. Pete seemed to feel himself that perhaps Novak, he said great things about all three, what was tough about all three, but he thought because of Novak's reach and his great return. Yes. And, he and might- they, they, I, I want to talk about the, the reach thing because it was interesting. Andre, if you look back at Andre, they say he was the best returner in the game. Maybe you can argue now Novak is, but at that point you said Andre is the best returner in the game. But if you look at the stats, Andre got aced a lot. And the reason being yeah. because he had to guess a lot, he didn't have the reach that Novak had. And I'll let you kind of continue Pete referring Novak to, to that reason. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. He had to guess a lot. He also was a very aggressive returner. He, he wasn't content to uh, Novak doesn't mind the idea a lot of times about just getting his racket on the ball, get the return back, even if it's not too deep and, and make the guy come up with something special. I've seen him frustrate Roger with that many, many times. And, but so yes, Andre, he wanted, he was guessing, but he also, he just felt like he had to be aggressive. I don't think he trusted his feet the way that his footwork is speed as much as Djokovic does. Right. That's another factor, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that those would have all been, I, I, I don't know how to speculate on what Agassi would do against these guys. As you say, he did have a lot in, in the latter stage of his career to play Roger that many times is remarkable. And uh, we'll never know. I, I suspect that, that uh, Andre oddly would have been, I think oddly he would have been most comfortable of, of, of the three playing a Rafa, uh, as long as it wasn't clay, as long as it wasn't clay. Yeah, he played him. He played him late in his career twice. I, he would have had trouble. That ball is so heavy, but again, like it's hard to compare. They had, they had a very interesting three setter in Canada in the finals, you know, the second and Wimbledon and Andre got killed, but they yeah. had this Canada that was really quite well played by both. I'm saying of the three, I, I believe he would have been most comfortable against no doubt. Not that he would have beaten him that many times, right. but that maybe that matchup might have been the best of the three. Well, yeah, the well, 2005 U.S. Open final against Roger was was good too for about three of the four sets. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, it was. No, yeah, that a good was a real good quality match too. It, it's interesting. It's hard to compare generations, but yeah, at least we were we had the treat of seeing it a little bit. Um, this was uh, this was fun. I, again, I mean, me as an Agassi fan. I've said this several times too. Yes, I was pro Andre, but I was never negative 
Pete. I respected the heck out of what Pete did. A lot of people, you know, like one player and hate everybody else. That was not me at all. Um, I respected the heck out of the rivalry. Um, to me, I, I think a fair argument for Agassi fans may, um, may you could say, did he have the bigger impact in the sports? He was the first one to come in, hit huge on both sides. Other guys had big forehands. Aaron Krigstein, Jimmy Arias came in big forehands. Andre was really the first both wings, especially on clay. You remember the 1988 French Open? He makes the semis. He's hitting winners from the baseline on a clay court. You really yeah. didn't see that. Um, so there, there are ways where you can say, yeah, Andre may have added something more to the sport than Pete, but between the, the, between yeah, the mean, lines. That's a good point. That's a good point. He was transformational in a way, I think, Lendl even more so. But, yes, he was. There's no doubt. But, but I think that the even larger impact was his personality, the way he appealed to general sports fans, the fact that he, he had a certain charisma about him and un, un, <laughs> unpredictable in terms of behavior or or what kind of match he was going to play on a given day or whether he was going to lose his temper or not or whether he was going to be bald-headed or long-haired. There were so many aspects to Agassi. Uh, while Pete was just a straightforward, you know, low-key guy out there trying to do his job and, and not trying to be a personality. And that, again, made the rivalry special, I think, because you had one guy, you know, who, who really was more dynamic than the other, but the other guy was, was, was the ultimate professional. That's how I saw this Sampras Agassi rivalry. Yeah. And I, um, it, it's interesting. Cause there's a, there's a, a writer that we both respect. His name is Richard Evans. And he wrote a book, the history of tennis. Great, great book. And he had a quote, I'm going to, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, I don't think it's word for word, but it's pretty damn close. He had a quote and it, it's interesting. Cause you have a little different take on whether we really should be comparing Andre and Pete versus maybe Andre to somebody else. And, I, and I'll read a little bit of it um, from Richard. And again, this is in the history of tennis. He said, only Fred Perry, Don Budge, Rod Laver, and Roy Emerson had won all four Grand Slam titles before Agassi. Agassi won the Australian and U.S. Opens on two different hard courts, including French Open on clay and Wimbledon on grass, emphasizing Andre's versatility and all-around skills. By the time Andre and Pete retired, what separated Sampras was that Sampras had a 20 to 14 winning record against them, but never even reached a Roland Garros final. Agassi had the ability to win everywhere on anything. Sampras tended to dominate when they met in the Grand Slams and had the bigger, more spectacular game. Richard con continues and said, says, who was better? The arguments will rage for as long as the game is discussed. And again, I, even if you ask Andre himself, I think Andre would have a hard time picking himself self admittedly. I don't think Andre would pick him, pick himself as far as what happened between those lines against Pete. You have an interesting take on this. Well, I think that, you know, I, I think that was a straw. I was surprised. Richard is, is such a great, he's, he's so erudite and such a great observer. And he started covering tennis back in 1960. And he was one of the first reporters that I met. I have great respect for his, for the breadth and scope of his work. And this book was was really well done and beautifully written. And but that was my one bone of contention when I reviewed it was to me, there is just no argument between Sampras and Agassi. When when one player wins 14 majors, the other wins eight, even though I, I, he stressed that Andre won the career Grand Slam. Yes, that Pete didn't do. But there were still six majors separating them. Pete was number one for six years at the end. He concluded six years at number one, Andre just once. And then especially those head-to-head -head meetings that you referenced earlier, you know, with Pete, yes, he lost, Pete lost to Andre at the French once in the quarters in 92 and a couple of times in Australia, a semi and a final, but, and the final was important, but he beat him in the only Wimbledon final and he beat him at, at also in a Wimbledon quarter. And then at the U S open three finals, and then that epic quarterfinal and the open was sort of neutral territory for them. So to me, it's not a matter that he, tended to beat him on big occasions he did beat him therefore it was no accident when you have five major finals he wins four of them to me that that's argument over where i think what's fascinating to me is where do we rank agassi versus McEnroe and connors because you know andre won his eight majors so did jimmy and john won seven and there there's there's much more comparable territory there to me the, the debate is is really compelling uh, uh, there, when you look at Agassi's versatility and his record, and then you look at Connors, and he won the U.S. Open on three different surfaces, so he counters Agassi in a way with that. And John was just so brilliant on fast courts, and he finished four years at number one. So 
Th that to, those are the those are the bar the debates and the bars that I would want to sit in on. You know, sitting on those stools and make and have that debate of where does where does Andre? Because to me, Sampras is clearly the the greatest American of all time, and and especially among these modern players, I just don't see how when they played in the same era and Sampras came out on top so many times when it mattered head to head that we can have that debate. Yeah, I would agree with you. And again, I mean, you got to, it's so interesting when you start comparing Johnny Mac and, and Andre, because that 84 French, I mean, that was in Johnny Mac's hands. And if Johnny, Johnny Mac wins that, then he has the grand slam. Um, that, that would be, well, he never, Australia. He didn't win Australia. I'm sorry. Did not win Australia. Yeah. So, so John, never, yeah, never had that. But Jimmy did. Jimmy actually did. So if Jimmy right. could have, if if Connors could have managed a French, then uh, he would have. But still, but still, I think that uh, those are the, those are those are fascinating debates because I think the records are more comparable when you look at the number of majors they won. You know, you, you see Mackinac having more years at number one than Andre, but not as versatile the record. But with Pete, I just think it was another league yeah. uh, because Pete, you have to measure him up against Novak and Roger and, and Rafa and, and, and the greats of today. And that, that, that to me is, and, and then Rod Laver. I mean, as Mackinac said to me in the book, if he had to pick a top five and he wouldn't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily be in this order, the top five would be Novak, Rafa, Pete, Roger, and Rod Laver, those five. Interesting. This was fun. I know we went longer than usual, but I don't think we could have gone any shorter when you're, when you're talking about these two and, and the impact they had on the sport. Um, a couple housekeeping items. Steve and I are going to come up with, we're going to create an email address. So um, any of our listeners have questions, obviously they can reach out to us on social media, but we're also going to have an email address. Um, we will announce that soon where you could ask us any questions about tennis. We'll do our best to answer them um, on the pod. So stay tuned for that. Uh, this was fun. Again, if you did not get a chance to listen to Steve uh, and my discussion with Mary Carrillo, um, Mary was sensational. She was great. Um, make sure to take a listen to that. Steve, this was a topic that we both are very passionate about. I enjoy. Uh, I, I want to thank you taking your time out of the evening and talking about this. I enjoyed it immensely. This, this was fun. Uh, David, I did as well. And, and, and uh, it, was, it was definitely worthy of a longer session. I suppose we could have talked all night long about Sampras and Agassiz. We could. Thanks. And we'll, <laughs> we'll talk soon, Steve. Okay. Thanks, David.